Hi everyone, and welcome to our discussion on how to unlock the full potential of modern B2B marketing and sales. I'm Nicola Anderson, CMO at MyTutor, and I'm delighted to be talking to Latany Conant, CMO at Sixth Sense, joining us here in London, all the way from Chicago. Latany is the author of the best-selling book, No Forms, No Spam, and No Cold Calls, the title of which must give many a CRO quite a chill. Latine, tell us a little bit about you before we get into discussing the inspiration behind the book, how to implement a customer-first, account-centric model, and some tips for sales and marketing in this somewhat tricky climate. Sure, so yes, all the way from Chicago. Love being Welcome. in London. And I have two boys, two teenage boys, and they tell me quite often how embarrassing I am. <laughs> so hopefully I'm not embarrassing them too much today. <laughs> from miles so and miles proud. away. <laughs> um, I love to wake surf, which is my new favorite thing. I've just had an education in wake surfing. It is amazing. It, it's amazing. It's a total game changer. I love it. And I am a recovering software salesperson. Recovering? Yes, yes. Every day, it's, it's a struggle. <laughs> Interesting move though, from sales to marketing. And I'm sure that's added a like, ton of value to some of the marketing apps that you do? I think that when you've walked in the shoes or walked in the moccasins, which I think is the, the uh, Native American Indian proverb, it does make it easier to, to have a shared understanding of how, just how hard it is. We I, think marketing's hard. Actually, sales is a lot harder, but I didn't say that. Edit that out. <laughs> Don't tell Mark. <laughs> so, Latany, what drove you to write this book in the first place? Has it always been on your bucket list to be an author? No. So I was an accounting major in college because I never wanted to have to write a paper. So I don't wow. fancy myself as a writer. It was not on a bucket list. Um, but what ended up happening was when I joined Sixth Sense, I was thrown into this new wild world of MarTech and sales tech. And I came from a company whose sole mission was customer experience. And I started looking around at, at sales tech and marketing tech and then juxtaposing that with, you know, what was in my soul before customer experience. And I thought, something's not right. You know, the, the way that we treat prospects who are actually future customers is, is kind of like dirt. Right? Um, they want to learn from us, so we gate our content and put up a form, which is ridiculous. You know, um, you know, we send 7 billion e emails a day. You know, there's, it's crazy. Um, and so no one's paying attention to that. And, and then when I think about a cold call, whenever someone cold calls me, they do this thing where they spoof my area code. And I think it's my kid's school calling. Oh, gosh. And it's heart drop. Yeah. So why would we want to put anyone through that experience? But, but that's kind of what we're set up to do with the systems and the processes and what, what we've learned over time. And so I thought, gosh, here I am at Sixth Sense, this amazing company, this innovative company, and we have all these insights. If we can't change the game, if we can't use these insights to provide a differentiated experience, one that puts the customer in the center, no one can. Uh, and I didn't have as much to lose, right? Because I'm the CMO of Sixth Sense and I'm using our technology for good. And, and so we decided to do that. And so I, it was interesting, I was having an offsite and I walked in and I, I, you know, I get, I'm easily excited. So I walk in with my team, I'm like all excited. I'm like, guys, we're gonna change everything. <laughs> you know, we are going to put customers in the center. We're gonna do an experience with no forms, no spam, no cold calls. Oh my goodness, I wish I'd been there at that moment. Oh God, one lady started crying. <laughs> wow, extreme reaction there. But yeah. yeah, I can imagine that, what on earth? Yeah, like you're crazy. That's what we do. Yeah, you're crazy, lady. Um, a couple people, you know, left along the way, um, and you know, I think some were just so, so hungover from the night before that they went with it. <laughs> <laughs> Had you been feeding them alcohol the night before? Yes, like, yes. This is my strategy to get this implemented. Exactly, exactly. Um, but but we did it. 
right? We did it. And, and it was the core to our go-to-market, which was a very successful go-to-market and continues to be, you know, 100% growth year over year, an industry-leading CAC, industry-leading magic number, retention, all those things that you want. And this approach is really the foundation of that. So people started asking me, how, what do you do? How did you do it? Customers started asking me. I started doing some advisory work. And every night, you know, in my off hours, I would be writing these long emails about like how we did it and attaching the template and this and that. And I'm like, I need to save myself some time. I'm just going to write it in one place. And so I started writing it in one place. And, and it, it's not meant to be, um, it's obviously not a, a mystery, exciting novel, but it, it is a playbook. And that's what I wanted. You know, I don't, I don't read a lot of business books in my spare time. I feel like I spend enough time working. <laughs> I'd rather like Netflix binge or, or be with my kids. Um, so I, I set out to really write a book that was very pragmatic, very actionable. And, and I think we achieved that. It is so practical. And that's what I loved about it. So it is a page turner because I'm like, where's the model behind this? What do I need to do? <laughs> yeah, we've got pictures in there, cartoons, how to's. Case uh, studies. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. I found it a page turner, even if it wasn't a detective story. So it's already been implemented by over a thousand companies. And that's some big names like Sage, Zendesk, Experian. What's the feedback been like? So, you know, you put your heart and soul into something and then you put it out into the world and you're like, oh, is, you, know, <laughs> you just wait, right? Uh, and it's been surprisingly amazing. You know, pe people will send me pictures of their book and it's all tattered and torn and highlighted oh. and post-its, uh, which feels r really good uh, personally and really good for the team. This was a team effort. This was not, not certainly not just me. Um, but the the rubber is in the rubber meets the road with the results, right? Um, again, that we're not we're not doing this for for our free time enjoyment. And so, when call after call we would get from customers saying, "This is a game changer. This this tightened the relationship between, or even fixed the relationship between sales and marketing." And oh, by the way, we started studying our customers. And so every quarter we look across um, hundreds and hundreds of, of quarters of data and companies like Sage, you know, companies like Zendesk are seeing two times bigger ASPs from the approach. Uh, wow. Significant. We were talking about the board meeting before the filming. That's, that's things boards care about. 20% uh, better conversions. Again, significant, wow. uh, and thirty percent faster cycle times. So, oh my goodness. so efficiency through the roof. It's all about efficiency. Yeah. So, some huge positives there. Yes. What have been some of their challenges? So, and, and it's interesting. So, this is the this is actually the second edition of the book, and people will say, "Is this a new book?" It's not a new book. It's the same book from two years ago, except I added some bonus material. And one of the things about the bonus material is I think that I missed some of the workflow required to implement right. this approach uh, between sales and marketing. And, and, and really nailing that, that workflow and nailing um, the SLA around the workflow. And, and, and really what it comes down to is, is the concept of multi-threading. And so if you are, if you truly have a B2B motion, probably not one person is going to buy your product. Probably two, probably three, probably more. Most of the studies are saying 19, 20 people involved in a buying decision for B2B. And today it's, it's with the economy the way it is, it's significantly more actually. It's, it's going up exponentially. And so that's where this concept of multi-threading is absolutely critical. And while I touched on it in, in the first book, I don't think I really nailed the SLA around it. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you go to any sales forecast meeting around the world, there is an angry sales manager <laughs> talking to a rep 
about a deal and he is saying, why are you only talking to one person? This is a single threaded deal. There's no way this deal is going to close. You're only talking to one person. And in marketing, we haven't had that mentality. Again, it goes back to this kind of form spam cold call approach. We get the form fill. We declare it an MQL and we throw it over the fence. You deal with it now. It's your problem, right? And an MQL by its very nature is a contact. A lead is a contact, one person. And so we're literally like throwing over the wall these single threaded deals. And the reality is the longer um, a sales cycle progresses, actually the harder it is to multi-thread. Uh, you know, I remember this as a seller, you start working with someone and they sort of like latch onto you and attach, and then they don't want you to talk to anybody else. You're mine. You know, yes, you're mine. You're mine. Exactly. And so by not multi-threading early, we're actually making it harder. And so what I talk about in the new edition is this SLA around marketing, not, not passing single threaded deals but making sure to multi-thread from the very beginning. So our SLA is, even if it comes inbound, so classic form fill, they want a demo, they want to meet, we still have forms if you want to meet and you want a demo right now. Um, we follow up with that person, but then we also have to follow up with two additional people. Oh. So we need three contacts before it's qualified. And then obviously when we see a 6QA, which is a, a qualified account that hasn't yet uh, filled out a form, then we also need to work that by multi-threading and reaching out to at least three contacts and getting meetings with three contacts. And so we're doing that way early, uh, which is you know significantly helping obviously our, our win rates and the quality of the pipeline. I don't think I have ever seen that as a criteria for an MQL, six contacts in the same company. Well, we just, I mean, we, we just studied one of the things that I do, and if you're a marketer, I think this is a very valuable experiment to start to do, is at the end of every quarter, I take all of the deals that we won, and I put them in a segment so that I can study the patterns. So I can see what content did they consume, uh, you know, what webinars did they attend, and how many people did we engage to win the deal. It's one of the things I look at. Q1, for us to win a deal, six, we needed six contacts. Q2, wow. 10. Q3 Gosh. just ended, just did this experiment, 13. So it's getting harder. And actually, this leads me on to my next question. You published V2 of the book before the economic downturn. Mm -hmm. If you were going to write it now, is there anything you would do differently? Sounds like more people are now getting involved in the buying process as one of those. Yeah, I, I think... You know, maybe the positioning of it would be different, but I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, you know, doing more with less isn't a great book title. <laughs> That's so relevant for yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah. So I think I, I would buy that now. Yeah, I could probably make the book title more, more relevant, but I'm not sure it would, um, it would be as, as exciting. Um, but, but the concepts in the book are highly relevant now, if not more, because... We've been in, in the last five years, we've seen extreme, um, I don't know, opulence. <laughs> you know, it, it's, been, it's been relatively easy. And, and so you didn't have to have the tightest processes, right? You could afford to have some waste in your marketing or in your sales. You didn't have to be laser focused on the right accounts and contacts. And now more than ever, this notion of focus, which is really actually the core of what I talk about in the book, um, is critical, you know? And, and actually we just did a study with BCG, we partnered with BCG and found $2 trillion of waste in sales and marketing, trillion with a T. And at first I was like, come on, but then you start to read through the study of missed opportunities, missed handoffs, you know, ads going to non-ideal customer, you know, ideal customer accounts, and you know, tech, irrelevant tech, salespeople who don't ramp or make quota. 
you, it does start to compound pretty quickly. And, and so we just have to, we've, we've got to be a lot more mindful of the, the, actually the efficiency numbers that I shared earlier. You know, that's, that's efficient growth is focusing on those three key numbers, ASPs, conversions, and cycle times. And I think not enough marketers do that. Uh, so a lot of times when I walk into a meeting with a group of new marketers or I do a keynote, I, ask, I say, show of hands, what is the most efficient way to double revenue? Answer A, double leads. Answer B, slightly improve cycle times, conversions, and win rates. And people are like, oh, B. And I'm like, yeah, then why are we so obsessed with you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like everyone knows it, but they haven't they haven't really been able to, I guess, implement it. Know and, how and to do it. it. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's that knee jerk it. reaction, panic. Oh, let's just get some more leads. On more, top. more, 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 it more. It feels like the easier option, even though it's absolutely not. Yeah. And you're just sometimes you're just jumping up and down. Yeah. And talking about efficiency, you talk a lot about the benefits of AI in your tech stack. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how it's really going to transform marketing and sales in the future? I use the term guesswork and, and I want to make sure that people don't have a knee-jerk reaction to that because while I don't think we have been irresponsibly guessing, I do think that for the most part we've had limited data sets to look at and lack the comp, you know, computational power to, to look at all of these patterns to really give us insights that are data-based. Um, and, and to me, when all of a sudden you use AI and you do have a lot more computational power and you can look at a lot more data sets, then all of a sudden you go to guessing to knowing and knowing with statistical accuracy. And that matters a lot, especially when, when you think about sales and marketing alignment, because opinions, we, we all want to win. And we all have the same objective, but a lot of times our opinions or notions get in the way. Whereas when everyone's on one sheet of music, knowing and trusting the data, it just is like a, it's a new level of alignment. We're focused on fixing the problem that we know is the right problem to fix right. versus debating where's the problem? I don't know. My data says this. Your data says that. Whose fault is it? Whose fault is it? Yeah. And so, um, and so a good example is uh, think about your ideal customer profile. A lot of people understand the concept of an ideal customer profile. And they want to think that they have an ideal customer profile. But when you ask 10 people at the company, you get 10 answers. Or the ideal customer profile was created by some consultant and it's like gathering dust. No one's using it. You know, it's a sheet of paper or a list in CRM. Well, let's say your ideal customers are 50 to 100 employees. That's changing all the time. Companies are growing. Companies are shrinking. And so when you have all of a sudden with AI, you have something that's always on and listening and saying, Nicola, let me find you customers that are, you know, less than 50 employees and in this region and, and maybe they're doing M&A or whatever your criteria is. It's always on surfacing accounts and you don't need to go to sales and say, I promise this is a good account. I promise. I think I, I know. Yeah, I know. I know, we know, because it's because yeah. the AI says that 90% of the time, these are the best accounts for us. And it's so, complete transparency, isn't it? Because you were saying how transparent you are with your data across the whole business. Which is critical. Yeah, so my dashboard, anybody at Sixth Sense can go look at my dashboard. Boom. Go. You know, yeah. and you can see our ASPs, you can see our conversions, you can see our cycle times by go-to-market segment and by channel. You can see our pipeline quotas. Are we meeting our, you know, um, sales has a quota. We should have a quota too. You know, are we, are we meeting those quotas? And, and, and if we're not, why? And, and it's okay. There's always, so it's interesting. Um, Sam Jacobs, who you know from Pavilion, I, I was just on a panel um, at the CRO summit. And one thing I was explaining 
to sales folks is marketer, we're naturally positive people. And so we don't always love to share bad news. Salespeople are totally biased to the negative. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because so I'm laughing. <laughs> I mean, I, you because honestly, like a deal review, you know, back to that sales manager who's freaking out at, at his AE. He's asking his AE, "What are red flags?" And red flags, identifying red flags, is part of a sales process, and it's finding all of the stuff that could go wrong in a deal. And red flags are actually good. When a rep comes to you and they have a, they, they have a deal plan that's littered with red flags and then they have a plan for how they're going to tie off on that red flag, you're like, oh my God, this, this guy or gal is on it. Yeah, they've got the plan. They've got it, right? When, when someone comes, oh, it's going to be great. You're like, oh, this oh, thing's... This is where the red flag is. Oh God, yeah, yeah. Happy ears, right? And so I've tried to instill in my marketing team, red is good because we know then what's going on. We know, yeah. and then we can go fix it. And so I try to be very, like celebrate it. Celebrate yeah. the red, we found it, now we can go do something. And I think that's just a little bit of a mindset shift for, for marketers. Really interesting. I just wanted to come back to the ICP piece because when I read this in your book, I did a little experiment at a dinner I was at and I asked everyone around my table, when did you last review your ICP? <laughs> and everyone just went, um, you're supposed it, to it, review it? It just is our ICP. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Do you think it's changed? And you could just see everyone going, oh, I don't know. Because tell me, how often do you review it? Well, I would say there is, there's two parts to that. One is if your ICP is dynamic and AI based, the accounts that meet the ICP are always changing, right? It's doing it for you. It's doing it for you. But, uh, another concept I talk about in the book is being a chief market officer. So if you call yourself a chief marketing officer, you're sort of focusing on the ing, which is the activities. The doing. Yes. I wrote a blog. I did a webinar. We did a bunch of events. Yeah. Whereas the most value I think you have to the company is understanding the market and bringing the market point of view the voice of the customer. The voice of the customer uh, to the company. And you don't call it a cheap selling officer. You don't call it a chief financing officer. It's not like our CFO is like, I closed the books. I tied out this ledger, right? I mean, yeah. right? He's ta talking about, you know, pro formas and, and the state of our finance, our finance. Um, and so... Part of being a chief market officer, I think, is looking at the market and saying, if the market has changed, maybe our ideal customer profile yeah. needs to change. And so you think about it right now, you know, certain sectors, and that was the same with COVID, certain sectors are going to be more affected. It might be a good time yeah. to start thinking about, um, you know, are there pockets of our TAM that we can start to focus on and, and create new areas of ICP. And so that's something I'm always doing, you know, pandemic or, you know, economic meltdown aside, is you want to be looking at your growth trajectory and saying, okay, this is how big my ideal customer profile is today. And, and this is how my territories are created. But if I have to go hire, I think next year we're going to have to hire, I don't know, 70, 80 new AEs. These are all little mouse to feed. And I don't want to give them a crappy territory. Yeah. Mark doesn't want to give them a crappy territory. So we start early when no one's in seat, warming up new segments to become Free new. marketing. Yes. Yeah to become ideal customers. You're always kind of managing the size of your ICP versus your, your size and your scale. And it means sales aren't going in cold. Yes, exactly. So I hope exactly. work for everyone. Go and look at your ICP. Look at it, look at it, refresh it, marry it back to you know, the size of your company. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting. Everybody wants to be a, uh, a category creator or everyone wants to be, um, you know, have a huge TAM. And when you go to get investment, 
you do your whole Tam Sam Psalm dance, right? <laughs> and that's that's useful for investors and that's useful for getting funding. But the but practically and like what we need every day is really that ideal customer profile. Yeah. Which ones are in market? Yeah. So the book is very much focused around ABM for sales and marketing and more of an enterprise focus. Do you think there's still value for customers that are focused more on the SMB audience, B2C, other departments, product, ops? So B2C, probably not as much. Um, a velo like we have a velocity business, um, which would be the SMB and the mid market, absolutely. Mm. Um, because the thing is, ABM to me is just as much who you proactively go after as filtering out noise and who you right. don't go after. That's quite a different view on ABM and much more relevant. Right, because yeah. again, you're trying to put, so the only resource an account executive has is their time. That's literally all they have. And so our job as leaders is to make sure that every salesperson is using their time wisely. And so when they're just getting this huge, uh, you know, funnel of stuff, you know, drinking from the fire hose, we're not helping them focus and use their time wisely. And so what we do with the velocity model is we overlay scores right. to be able to say, these are the most likely to win, spend a lot of time on these. These are not as likely to win. That doesn't mean we still don't have a process for them. That doesn't mean we still don't have an experience for them, but it might not be as high touch. Could be a bot. We're, you, we're doing a lot with bots, you know, um, that, that carries on a conversation with those to see and, and qualify a little more before it goes to sales. So you're tiering? You've got your tier ones, tier yes. twos, tier threes, and that determines how much effort you put into them? Yeah. Yeah, same thing with like a PLG motion, because you have all these people now using your product, right? PLG is product-led growth. You have all these people using your product, and you pass sales like, act, oh, these are users, but is it the right company? Is it the right persona? Like, you know, so I think there's always this applicability of using AI to focus your team. Yeah, it's really interesting, and I think there's so much value in implementing this new methodology. But one of the challenges, I think, us CMOs have, especially as we're chief marketing officers, we're doing, is getting buy-in from the rest of the business. Have you got any tips from how you can really get that buy-in from, from the rest of that leadership team, those other departments? So, um, I think a couple things. You can't stand for everything and get stuff done. Just general, this is more generalities, right? But I think one of the things that has helped me along the way is to really prioritize the things that I care about and I say I'm gonna die on the sword for, right? And then some things you gotta let go. So you sort of have to decide, is this a hill that I'm gonna die on the sword for to get done? So I think that's the first thing and, and really champion it. Um, the other thing is, you know, sometimes starting small, um, works well and and there's always a sales team that's more willing to try you know so you find you find your people you know you find the people that are the most willing to try you make it successful success breeds success and and then all of a sudden it's like this kind of a snowball you talk in your book about the tiger team the yes. early adopters yes. tell us a little bit about that I always, so everyone wants to feel special. Yes, so please. whenever I have something big that I want to do that I know is going to be hard and, and involve a lot of change, I create a cross-functional team and I call them a tiger team and I make a big deal about it and they get special swag and like, you know, I mean, I'm a marketer, right? Do they get good, good baseball hats on Yeah, baseball, here? whatever, <laughs> right? And, and I, you know, and you want, you want them to feel like, uh, it's their idea, not your idea. Yeah, it's a little bit Absolutely. of a Jedi mind trick, right? Um, you know, I, I want that team to feel like this isn't Latney telling me I need to do this. This is my idea and my contribution. And then they go out into their respective functions. They're your champions and help champion it. Um, and then the other thing I talk about in the book is 
whether it's a one page business plan or that's a really good book. That book changed my life. But or I now use something called a V2 mom, which was actually like incubated and pioneered by Mark Benioff, which he's a he's a pretty smart guy. <laughs> pretty smart. Um, but it's how he rolls out the strategic plan at Salesforce every year. And V2 mom is the V2 is vision values. So V2. And the mom is method, owner, and metrics. And so, and what I like about the framework is the vision gets people excited. Yeah. It's bold. It feels cool. It feels new. The values keep you on, on track. They kind of prevent you from throwing a gutter ball and bowling. And then the methods are like what we actually have to go and do. And you can fit it on one page. It's very clear. And so that kind of becomes a walking around document too. Right. To say, this is what we're doing. This is how we're measuring ourselves. Uh, and, and you always need to champion change. You need a, that crisp walking around document, I think. Um, yeah. Just like you do when you do the one pager for yes. your clients. Yes, exactly, exactly. And is this how you implemented the no forms, no spam, no cold calls? Internally, so you made this big announcement at the event, and then is that how you rolled it out yeah. through your Tiger team? Yeah, through it through the Tiger team, and through you know keeping ourselves honest with the V two mom, and and again we we stumbled along the way, which I I write about honestly and openly because that's when you learn. Yeah, you don't learn when you're crushing things; you learn in the kind of depths of despair. <laughs> uh, so I talk about that, and um, and then we just you know we were able to not only walk around the vision and the values, but the methods and then the metrics. So this is what we've been able to achieve, which starts to get people really excited. And then suddenly everyone wants to roll this out and it's not you there fighting for this new way of marketing working and everyone's like, don't know anything about this, no thanks, not a priority. Right, I, I did that, I was yeah. on that team. Yeah. You know, this is, this is a company-wide thing. Yeah. I know you weren't ever expecting to be an author, but now you've written one book, two editions, is there going to be another one? I think so. Ooh. So the process starts with a white, I have a huge whiteboard in my office. <laughs> and so, and I've been, you know, I've got some new things that I've learned. And they, they always say the best books are the one for business are the ones that you write because you wish you had. And so, you know, I'm, I've figured a bunch of new things out and, it's exciting for me to learn and share. Like that's what keeps me going. And so I've, I've got some new concepts that I'm working on. Um, Any teasers? Well, uh, <laughs> you know, for those who know me, I, I, uh, I have fear of not being prepared. Um, and I have fear of, fear of being fired. Um, and so- Which is such a ridiculous thought to me, but. But Great it, to share. Yes, yes. Um, but it's volatile. Our job yeah. is volatile, and I hate that for us. Yeah. Um, and in marketing, especially, and in sales, sales and marketing leaders, it's 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 a tough gig. And so, um, one chapter is I've already decided is the three B's for not getting fired, which is uh, board prep, uh, budget, and and benchmarks. And I've already kind of got that sketched out. Um, I need this book. When's it coming out? <laughs> it might take a year, so <laughs> give me some Speed time. Up. Can we shorten yeah, the, the yeah. writing cycle, please? <laughs> I'll try to get my kids on it. <laughs> they can help me. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Thanks for the encouragement. I appreciate it. No, I'm excited about this. So November next year. I I'm like hoping. your clothes plan. Nicholas got me on a clothes plan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Latina, I could keep talking for hours, but that would be quite selfish as I know lots of the listeners are going to have plenty of questions. So just before we wrap up, any key takeaways for those listening today? I would say just great things don't happen by not breaking a little bit of glass. And so um, be bold. Another B. Yeah, especially right now. Yeah in this market. Yeah, it, it's time to be bold. Thank you so much. I've really loved our conversation. And please do everyone, write questions in chat and Latinese here to answer them. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola.